And uh, shifting to my presentation, I would like to remind you what is a beat phenomenon here. So there is here a sound generator emitting, you know, two sounds at uh, different frequencies. And you remember, if the two frequencies get very close to each other, but not being identical, you will hear a modulation yeah, in amplitude yeah, of the sound. Yeah? So just a reminder, so I try to make it work. Okay. Do, do you hear? Change. So there is a frequency of the sound, yeah, which is quite loud here, uh, quite quite low frequency. But then you may hear the modulation. Did you hear it? No. So this is the maximum sound. So. Yeah, something like that. Okay, now I'll come to the core of my presentations. Yes, and this is where the table, well, I think it's not the correct size, so I try again. <coughs> Oops. Okay, this is better. So, table of contents, yeah? You remember yesterday, well, there was a brief introduction, general introduction, then I proceeded with some reminders, yeah? And mainly the complex representation of an electromagnetic wave. And, uh, what we established yesterday is that the expression of the electric field, yeah, could be shown as follows. Real amplitude, yeah, times well, complex exponentiation where you see the space coordinates, and then an additional one where you see the dependence as a function of the time, yeah. So it, it is an expression to which I shall refer today, so I just indicated it here. Then uh, we, we spoke about the principle of a Huggins Fresnel, you remember, combining uh, with the constructions of Huggins yeah, for the propagation of electromagnetic waves with the idea of uh, interference between the secondary wavelets. Oh, then it was a brief history about the measurements of stellar diameters, and you remember, we saw that um, our ancestors saw that the diameter of the stars was about two arc minutes. And this, this is a angular resolution of our own vision, yeah, our, our own eyes. So a pupil, which size is about, well, varying between one millimeter and five millimeters. Then Galileo, yeah, uh, while sitting inside behind a rigid wire, measured the angular diameter of Vega as being about five seconds of arc. And then we saw that this, uh, this diameter yeah, was, in fact, uh, the result yeah, of the seeing effects, yeah, atmospheric seeing effects. Then Newton, very bright, yeah, you remember, where well, it reminds me, yeah, the, the song of the Beatles, the fool on the hill, yeah, and the song says that and the fool on the, on the hill sees the sun going down, and the eyes in his mind sees the world spinning round, yeah, and I think Newton could have been, a, you know, a very good uh, Beatles, yeah, and because he got a very good estimate, yeah, of what the angular size of a star should be, yeah? So he just thought about the sun, and he said, well, place it at the distance of Vega so that it would appear as a zero magnitude star. So using the relation between magnitude, yeah, and uh, luminosity and distances, yeah, he inferred that the angular diameter of the sun would be of the order of several mini arc seconds, yeah? Well, then came uh, Fizeau and uh, Stefan, who propose yeah, to derive the stellar diameters of star while observing, well, most of the bright star with an 80 centimeter Marseille telescope, yeah, which was yeah, 80 centimeter, and they could not resolve, they could not see the disappearance of the fringes yeah, while using the, the mirror as a basic interferometer. Okay, then uh, we ended up yeah, with the construction of our small uh, 
milli interferometers, yeah, and uh, well, you understood, yeah, yesterday how it worked, yeah, and uh, okay, so today we will continue, <coughs> and uh, with a very important chapter about light coherence, yeah, and the first subsection is about quasi monochromatic light. Okay, so light coherence is a theory, yeah, which essentially consists, yeah, in a statistical description of the properties of the radiation field in terms of the correlation between electromagnetic variations, vibrations at different points in the field. So, let me explain you what what does that mean, yeah? Okay, so as you know, we are not observing, you know, usually with a extremely narrow band filter, but with a narrow band filter which has a certain width, yeah, and sometimes it's a broad band filter, yeah. So here I have represented the spectrum of a white dwarf, and uh, I've just isolated yeah, the narrow band spectral range that we use yeah, for our observations. Yeah? So it is centered around the frequency nu, and the width yeah, is 2 delta nu, so it's uh, the frequency passing through the filter or nu prime belonging to the range nu plus or minus delta nu. Yeah. No, well, just as for monochromatic light, yeah, we can define the intensity of such a radiation field. So we, we saw that the intensity was the time average yeah, of the electric field Vt multiplied by its complex conjugate. Well, in this case, yeah, the electromagnetic field yeah, con consists in the contribution yeah, of uh, Many, many electromagnetic waves emitted at frequency nu prime in this range. Yeah? So, what shall we do? Well, we may just write that the electric field yeah, is an integration between nu minus delta nu and nu plus delta nu of well, the real, the real amplitude. So, I would say a nu prime. Because, well, it could slightly depend on the frequencies. Multiplied by all of these, yes, I could write E2 pi nu multiplied by, well, here I put nu prime, of course, times T. Now, minus, minus what? It's Z over lambda, but lambda is C over nu. So, here I can just divide this one by C. And now integrating in this spectral range. Do you agree with that? Or is there any difficulty? So this represents just contributions of all the electromagnetic radiation, yeah, contributing the frequency nu prime in this spectral range. Now what what I will show yeah, is that in fact the resulting electromagnetic field will still be a field oscillating with a frequency nu, yeah, but with an amplitude subject to the beat phenomenon. Okay? So how do I proceed? Well, there is a little trick. I will just insert here inside the integral, yeah, the following quantity. In minus two pi nu. Minus B over C. And now I put it here, it's conjugate complex, I put to nu times D minus C over C. I can say that the representation of the electric field takes the following form. It is an amplitude which will depend on the space and time variables, multiply by this quantity. Nu times t minus z over c. Now, well, I have to represent what is this quantity. Yeah? Of course, this quantity should be equal to all of this. Yeah? So it will be integration from nu minus delta nu, nu plus delta nu of, of nu prime 
multiply by e to pi nu multiply by uh, no first I will do like this new minus new prime now multiply by t minus z over c d new prime do you agree with that result yeah so this is essentially this quantity yeah now to show you that this amplitude which is a complex amplitude yeah varies yeah with the frequency of the bit phenomenon yeah I will do the following. I shall assume that the amplitude A of new prime is a constant. It means that, well, over this spectral range, yeah, the amplitude doesn't vary significantly. Yeah? So let's assume that A new prime is a constant. So it's equal to A0. So this quantity will become equal to A0 multiplied by and now I will make a change of variable, yeah? Excuse me? The power of 2 pi i nu is a sign of rank because you have plus nu prime in this equation, but you have a minus. Yeah. So, you will do like that. It's okay? Set. Yeah. So, I will make a change of variable. Let's define w, yeah? As being equal to i to pi new prime minus new times t minus z over c now dw will be equal to i to pi times t minus z over c multiplied by d new prime okay and uh, and that's all yeah so this will be equal to so I should change my limits of integration. If I put here nu minus delta nu, it will be here minus i to pi delta nu times t minus z over c. And here to plus i to pi delta nu times t minus z over c. Multiply by E, this is W, times D nu prime, which will be D W divided by I to pi times T minus Z over C. Correct? So now it's easy to perform this integration. It will be A0 divided by that quantity i to pi times t minus z over c multiply by this quantity yeah, that I evaluate for the two limits of integration yeah? so it will be e i to pi times delta nu times t minus z over c minus e to pi delta nu times t minus z over c and I close my parentheses and now here you see it's just e i x minus e minus i x yeah so this will be two times i times the sign yeah of the argument yeah so it becomes equal to a zero divided by so the high and the two will disappear. So it will be divided by pi times t minus z over c multiplied by the sine of two pi delta nu times t minus z over c. Okay. So what what I see is that the Complex amplitude, yeah, varies as a function of time, but not anymore with a frequency nu, which is extremely fast, yeah, but with a frequency delta nu, which means that it's a very slow variation, yeah. 
And so this is the result yeah, of combining yeah, light radiation yeah, within a narrow spectral range is to get quasi-monochromatic light. Yeah? But it does, well, it does still oscillate with the frequency new, but the amplitude yeah, varies very slowly with the frequency delta nu. OK. And this is shown maybe, OK, this is a demonstration here. So while combining yeah, beams of electromagnetic radiation at a frequency nu prime in a narrow band range, it's equivalent yeah, to get finally a quasi-monochromatic light, which still varies with the frequency nu, but which amplitude yeah, is subject to the bit phenomenon. OK. So what I've said now is in terms of a time dependence. Yeah? You now you, you could wonder, what if I freeze the time and I look at the train of radiation yeah, as a function of the distance? Yeah? Well, it's easy. We know that so the, the, the period of the bit phenomenon that I could tell t is equal 1 over delta nu. OK, now, if you prefer to look yeah, at the phenomenon as a function of time, so we see that the spacing between uh, two maxima here is 1 over nu. Yeah? So it's a very short period. And now, if I look here, what is the time interval yeah, between the two blue lines? Well, it's a period of the bit phenomenon, 1 over delta nu. Now, I may look in a different way along. I'm not considering any more the time variation. I freeze the time. And I look at the function of the distance. Yeah? How does this train of uh, electromagnetic uh, radiation varies? Yeah? So what I do is the following. I say, OK, nu is equal to uh, c over lambda. Do you agree? Nu equals c over lambda, which means that delta nu is equal to minus c over lambda square times delta lambda. Yes? OK. Now, what do I do? Uh, I will do the following. I will, I will say, OK, in terms of wavelengths, yeah, L is equal to C over delta nu. So I divide C by delta nu. And now I see, I see that C over delta nu is equal, well, in spite of the negative sign, yeah, to lambda square over delta lambda. OK? So I see that. This length is much longer than the wavelength, yeah? And this is called the coherence length, yeah? Of the field of radiation. So this is a function of distance, yeah? So this is the coherence length. So this is, of course, a very nice result. Because if you would like later, yeah? To take two beams of radiation and let them interfere together, well, one condition yeah, is the following, is that the difference in the trajectories of the two light beams coming in the focal plane yeah, should be less or equal to the coherence length of the light. Yeah? Now, if you take, yeah, as Michelson, yeah, a wavelength of 5,000 angstrom, a bandwidth of about 1,000 angstrom, you find that this is of the order of 1.5 microns. Yeah? And this was the accuracy yeah, with which they had to establish yeah, where the difference in length of the two beams coming into their interferometers. Yeah? So using a beam of seven meters on top of a telescope, et cetera, et cetera, they, they had to make sure that the difference in length yeah, was less or equal to a few microns. And this is the difficulty yeah, of optical infrared interferometry. At radio wavelengths, yeah, you are much more relaxed. Yeah, the constraint, yeah, it's just that, well, if you are good within a few centimeters, it's good, yeah? And for engineers, yeah, this is not a hassle. OK, so this is already one thing. Now, we could wonder now, what becomes the visibility of the interference fringes in the Young's whole experiment for the case of quasi-monochromatic cells having a 
finite, dim finite di dimension. Yeah? So yesterday, when we consider the Young's experiment, yeah, we consider that the two holes were infinitely small, that the light source was infinitely small, and that the light was purely monochromatic. Yeah? So now we will try to relax yeah, all those hypotheses. Yeah? So first consider that it's quasi-monochromatic light, not monochromatic. Then the, the source is not, is not point-like, yeah? it's a finite, finite dimension. And then later on, that the holes in the screen of Young are not point-like, but as a finite dimension, just like apertures of telescope. Yeah? OK, so to, to do that, yeah, well, I still consider the Young screen here, well, still with two point-like holes, still, P1, P2, and a source of light with a finite dimension and emitting quasi-monochromatic light. And what I'm wondering is, well, given a point Q in the, in the screen of the observer, what is the resulting intensity? What we did before <coughs> is that I can represent the electric field as complex amplitude varying yeah, very slowly with a, a frequency delta nu multiplied by, well, this frequency still is a function of time. Yeah? OK. So well, I know that OK, the intensity yeah, at, the, at the point Q will still be equal to the time average yeah, of where the conjugate complex of the electric field multiplied by the electric field itself. Yeah? Now I may wonder, but what VQ at the time t is equal at? Yeah? Do you agree? Well, it will be the contribution yeah, from the first hole, for hole number one. But evaluate it at the time t minus t1q, where t1q yeah, is a propagation time for the light to go from the first hole to the point q. Plus, same, with electric field yeah, coming from the hole number two, but correct it for the, the propagation time t2q, t, t2q, like that. Now I will make just a translation in time. Let's assume that I define T prime equal T minus T1 minus T1Q. So I will say okay, VQ as a function of time T prime is equal to V1. It's a time T prime plus V2. Okay, so T now is equal to T prime plus T1Q, so it's minus. T2Q, T1Q, like that, yeah? Now, I define the delay between T2Q, T, T2Q and T1Q as being tau. And I may rewrite this expression, VQ as a function of T prime, as being equal to V1, at time t prime plus v2 at times t prime minus tau. Yeah? You know, I still make a time translation, yeah? I shift, yeah, the needles on my clock. I say, okay, I may write this as follows. So I don't need the prime, okay? So before it was Indian time, now it's Belgian time. Okay. Now, what next? Well, I will insert this expression into this one because I'm interested by the expression of the intensity. Yeah? So what I will get is that IQ is equal to, first of all, I will have V1 conjugate complex times I will have V1 of T. Plus, I will have V2 times T 
minus tau times v2 t minus tau. Then I will have plus v1 t times v2 t minus tau plus v1 t times v2 conjugate complex t minus tau. Tell me if you agree with that. Yeah. So I have uh, two factors here, two here, and then I just distribute, yeah, and I get one, two, three, four. Yeah. Now let's assume for simplicity yeah, that my two holes are identical. So the two holes are, are identical, yeah. So what does this represent? Well, this represents in fact the intensity due to hole one. This is also a time average, yeah? So this represents yeah, the intensity of hole number two. But since I consider that my two holes are identical, yeah, I may say that, okay, uh, I may rewrite this expression as high plus high, where I are yeah, the intensity due to hole one plus hole two. And this is what I would expect if I had no interference of light that at a given point Q, I'm receiving contribution of point of hole one and hole two. But the, there is interference, and this is where it comes in, yeah? So plus, now I can do the following, uh, plus V1 star times V2 T minus tau, plus time average of V1 times V2 conjugate complex T minus tau, like that. Yeah. Okay, so we are doing some good progress. Now I should like to simplify yeah, the summation of these two terms. Yeah? And uh, does anyone know the answer yet or no? If not, yeah, I will make a small digression, yeah? Well, let's consider two complex number, Z1, which is equal to the real part plus the complex part, and Z2 equal A2 plus high times B2. Now, you know the answer, yeah? Yes. Theoretical physicists know the answer. Astronomers don't. <laughs> but we know how to establish, yeah? Which I think is, is the most important, yeah? Not to, to remember anything, but to be able to recover the results, yeah? So now, what I shall do, I shall make Z1, Z2 conjugate complex plus Z1 conjugate complex times Z2. So it just reminds you what we have here, yeah? Yeah? So, Let's 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 try to find what it will be equal to. So it's a one plus i b one multiplied by a two minus i b two plus a one minus i b one times a two plus i b two. So this is equal to a1 times A2. Now, minus minus, yeah? So it will be a plus B1, B2. Okay. Now I still have A1, A2. So this is twice. And now I will have minus, so plus B2, B1, B2. So it's correct. Plus. I multiply by, so I will have uh, A2 B1, A2 B1 minus A1 B2. And now here I will still have A1 B2, or A1 B2, correct? So uh, A1 B2, so it, it will go away, right? And then uh, the other one. 
minus a two b one. So it goes away. Yeah. So what what I find is that uh, this result is just that. Now let's do something different. Let's try to take z one star times z two. So this is easy. Z one star times z two. Yeah. Is uh, a1 minus ib1 multiplied by a2 plus ib2. So it's equal to a1, a2 plus b1, b2 plus i. And I don't care about that. Because what I notice immediately yeah, is that this quantity is twice that quantity. Yeah? And that quantity is just the real part of z1 star times z2. So I can say, OK, this is also equal to twice the real part of z1 conjugate complex times z2. So here, I may write, I may continue and say, OK, this is equal to 2 high plus 2 times the real part of V1 conjugate complex multiplied by V2 at the time t minus tau, like this. And now, what I do, look, I multiply here by high. And I divide here by high. Okay? And this quantity, well, this quantity here is what gives rise yeah, to the phenomenon of interference. Yeah? And it is called the, do you know what is, how it is called? Yes. So what? Correlation well, it's a co correlation coefficient, yeah, but it's a complex amplitude, yeah of mutual coherence. So the correct naming yeah, is a complex amplitude yeah, of mutual coherence. Yeah. The intensity in the observer screen yeah, is equal to 2i multiplied by 1 plus uh, well, the real part of gamma 1, 2, which only depends on tau, where gamma 1, 2 of tau is equal to the time average of well, the correlations between the two fields yeah, at the two points, like that. So this is called, this is named yeah, the complex amplitude of mutual coherence. So the intensity yeah, in the observer screen yeah, is equal to what? Well, the contribution from the two holes, yeah, plus their interfering contribution, yeah? which is twice intensity multiplied by the real part yeah, of the complex degree of mutual coherence. Yeah? So you see, this is a well, correlation yeah, coefficient, which measure the degree of correl correlation yeah, of the two electric fields yeah, at point one and point two. OK. Now, yeah, I should like still to simplify. Yeah? Uh, the expression accounting for this factor, and uh, I shall proceed as follows. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Well, I know that the expression yeah, of vi as a function of t yeah, is equal to. So I make use of this expression. Well, it's a complex amplitude. Multiply by I2 I nu tau. 
So if I multiply V1 conjugate complex by V2 for T minus tau, I will find that is equal to A1 CT multiplied by A2 conjugate complex as a function of Z T minus tau, like that. Now, multiply by this quantity, and then the conjugate complex of the other one. So what will remain, essentially, is the exponentiation of i2 pi nu tau. Because uh, the multiplication of this factor by its conjugate complex will be equal to 1. So it will just disappear. Okay? So this is what will remain. Now, I will have to take the time average, but this does not depend on time, yeah? So, the time average will be equal to this time average. Now, let's divide it by i, by i. And w w what I obtain, well, is just the expression of gamma 1, 2, function of tau, okay? Now, if I would take uh, the module yeah, of this expression, so the module of gamma 1, 2, or what I could still do is just to say, well, another way yeah, to account for that expression would be to write that the complex degree of mutual coherence is equal to its module, gamma 1, 2 of tau, multiplied by something to make this quantity complex. So I beta 1. Do you agree with that? That gamma 1, 2, gamma 1, gamma 1, 2 of tau, which is a complex yeah, quantity, is equal to its module, yeah, multiplied by yeah, something in that plane. Yeah? OK, but now the module of gamma 1, 2 of tau is equal to what? Well, is equal to the module of that, but the module of this is 1, so what will remain is the module of A1, Z tau, multiplied by A2, Z T minus tau, like this, divided by I. You agree? Now I will make an assumption. Yeah, I will assume that tau, so the time delay, yeah, is much smaller than the period of the bit phenomenon, which is one over delta nu. So it means that well, I have a very good, uh, I have a very small time difference yeah, between the two beams coming at the point Q. If I do that, I can say, well, I know that, you know, uh, the electromagnetic field of radiation, which varies with the frequency nu, is an amplitude which varies slowly. But if I assume that the time delay is very small, it means that taking it for tau or for tau equals zero is about the same. Okay? It's, it's a good approximation. So I may say, well, this is also the same value for tau equals zero. And this is equal to gamma 1, 2, for tau equals 0. Okay. So this is essentially due to the fact that the amplitude varies very slowly. Yeah? And if I make the assumption that the time delay is much smaller than the bit phenomenon, the period of the bit phenomenon, yeah, I can say that the module of that quantity is equal to the module of that quantity for tau equal to 0. Okay? So what all of that becomes, well, I find that gamma 1, 2 as a function of tau is equal to the module of gamma 1, 2 for tau equals 0 multiplied by this quantity, so exponentiation of high multiplied by beta 1, 2, but then plus 2 pi nu times tau.
And this is uh, the very important result here yeah, that I wanted to establish with you. Yeah. Uh, so it's plus or minus, well, it doesn't matter, yeah? Uh, because later on, yeah, we'll take the real part. So well, it's of no significance, uh, the difference in sign, yeah? It depends. You see, here I took uh, the star on A2 instead of taking it on A1, yeah? But uh, in fact, yeah, gamma 1, 2 is equal to that, or it's also equal to that. It's the same. No difference, yeah, okay? So the small difference of sign, yeah, between what I have established on the blackboard and what is on the transparencies, yeah, is of no importance, yeah. Now, well, I come back here, and I would like to simplify this expression still a little bit, and uh, I will do it as follows. If I take the real part of that, yeah, this is a module, yeah? So the real part of that is a cosine, yeah? So it will be 1 plus the module of gamma 1, 2, tau equals 0, multiplied by the cosine of beta 1, 2, plus or minus, yeah? 2 pi nu tau. Yeah. And I will close this bracket here. So this is expression, yeah? So don't mind about the difference in sign here, yeah? It's of no importance. It means that on my screen, distant screen, yeah? What, what I shall see, yeah? Le let's assume that the module of gamma 1, 2, yeah? Is equal to, well, I. I cannot tell you to what it would be equal because uh, I, I have jumped one step. So let's define now the visibility. Well, this will give rise uh, to fringes, of course, yeah, in the observer screen. But now I would like to define what is the contrast, the visibility of the fringes. Yeah? So the visibility, yeah, I remind you, is equal to the maximum intensity minus the minimum intensity divided by the summation of the two, I max plus I min. Okay? So, can someone tell me what is the maximum value of this expression when, when tau vary? Tau vary means that I, I'm, I'm moving yeah, on the, on the, in the observer plane. So, your Greek cosine can go from minus one to plus one, yeah? So, maximum will, will happen when cosine is equal to one. So I max will be equal to 2i multiplied by 1 plus the module of gamma 1, 2 for tau equals 0. OK. Now I also indicate I max below 2i 1 plus module of gamma 1, 2 for tau equals 0. Module close. Now here I have minus and here I have plus. I mean, yeah? I mean will happen for cosine equal to minus one. So here it will be minus two high multiplied by one minus module of gamma one two for tau equals zero. And here same, huh? plus two high one minus module gamma 1, 2, for tau equals 0, like that. OK. So it means that the visibility will be equal to what? It's easy. 2i and 2i goes away. So it remains 4i times the module of gamma 1, 2, for tau equals 0, divided by what? Well, here, the module of gamma 1, 2 go away, yeah? because here I have a plus and here a minus. So what remains is 4i. And so what I find yeah, at the end is that the visibility of the fringe is directly equal to the module yeah, 
of the complex degree of mutual coherence. Yeah? So it's equal to the module of the complex degree of mutual coherence. Very simple, yeah? Now, yesterday we've seen that the visibility yeah, can either be one maximum when the source is not resolved, or zero when it is resolved. Yeah? So I know now, oh, OK, this, this is really a, well, a correlation coefficient, yeah? which may vary between zero, no, no correlation, and one. Yeah? So now, you see, what I obtain well, is, uh, this is a very nice expression that in the screen of Young, if I assume that the source is being resolved, yeah, the source is being resolved. We've seen yesterday visibility equals zero. So it means gamma one two is equals to zero. So what is the visibility of the fringe? No visibility. So it means uh, the screen is uniformly bright. Yeah? I don't see any interference feature. Now, if you look at the star, point like star, you don't resolve it, yeah? The visibility is equal to one. It means that the complex degree of mutual coherence is equal to one. And what I see in that case, well, nice fringes with a minimum equal to zero and a maximum which depends on the brightness of the star, yeah? And now I have all the intermediate cases, yeah? between zero and one. And what we will see next, yeah, so this is the next section, yeah, is that the complex degree of mutual coherence is directly related to the structure of the source, yeah, which is not a big surprise, yeah. But this is uh, the next next section, yeah. So what, what I suggest, because um, next section, yeah, OK. So we will see in the next section that the module of gamma and 2 is directly related to the structure of the source that we are observing here. Yeah? And um, before going to that, yeah, I propose to you, well, two questions. Let's assume that we are making the Young's holes experiment with two point-like holes for the case of monochromatic waves, so not even quasi-monochromatic. And well, an infinite, infinitely small point like source, yeah? What is the value of module of gamma one two? How much? Zero, zero point five or one? <laughs> one. It's one. Yeah. It's what what we saw yesterday, yeah. We were looking at the point like source with the Young's horse experiment. And we are seeing uh, fringes, nice fringes, with uh, I max and I min equal to zero. So, so it means the visibility equal to one, complex degree of mutual coherence equal to one. And now, and what can you say about the source when gamma one two equal to zero? What can you say? Is that what? Yeah, visibility is equal to zero. It means that we are resolving the source. We are resolving, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's now evaluate, yeah, the value of the complex degree of mutual coherence, yeah, for the case that we are interested in, namely an extended source, yeah, emitting quasi-monochromatic light. And this leads us directly to study the notion of the spatial, special coherence of light, yeah. And uh, so you see we, from the Young's experiment, yeah, we have relaxed uh, one hypothesis as assumption. Light is not monochromatic, it's quasi-monochromatic, yeah? Now, what we are relaxing now is the fact that uh, the source is not point-like, is it will be extended, yeah? And next, and this will be uh, next week, yeah, we will assume finite dimension for the apertures in the whole in the Young's whole experiment, yeah.